Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness, where we will be sharing insights into the world of mental health and wellness as we explore traditional medicine and holistic healing options. It's time to have new conversations about mental health. Join Mara James, the founder and CEO of the Hugs for Life Healing Center, as she guides us along this journey. And now, let's talk wellness. Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mara James, and I want to say thank you for joining us for today's conversation. During Let's Talk Wellness, we focus on healing, understanding, growth, and spirituality. This is part of the Hugs for Life Healing Center, a subsidiary of the nonprofit organization called Extraordinary Lives Foundation, where we are devoted to supporting mental health awareness and providing resources for children and their families. As the founder of these organizations, I have the great joy of collaborating with a team of amazing people to help bring healing to children and their families around the world. You can find out all of our information at elfempowers.org, and you can find the link in the show information. Now, let's talk wellness with that. today's guest, Faust Ruggiero. Faust is a psychologist and author. Welcome, Faust. Thanks for having me, Mar. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so great to have you, and um, I love that we're East Coast, West Coast, and uh, we get to unite right here with uh, Keisha in Texas. <laughs> so, Foss, people always like to know, and I want to hear, um, why did you get into this field? Well, I've been doing this now. It's 43 years. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, it kind of picked me. I mean, it's just who I am. It's the way I think. It's the way I feel. Uh, spiritually everything it's it's just who i am uh so you know it's it's not something that i i, I think i chose and it's not something that uh, has let go of me yet so i'm still doing it <laughs> it's not gonna let go until you go to pass over <laughs> i love that so did you encounter any childhood um extreme trauma yourself extreme you know we had a, a close family typical italian family and uh but when i was around nine my father had a pretty serious stroke he was young 42 uh but that changed the family dynamic you know that now now i'm growing up pretty quickly and uh you know taking on some things that typically kids don't take on so i'm sure that has something to do with me fixing the world after i had to fix mine i thought well what the heck I, i'm doing this so i might as well turn it outward <laughs> I love that. And so your true passion you shared with me the other day is about helping people. Yeah. Um, and I always love to ask people, do you practice what you preach? I do. You know, um, I, 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 I'm my own guinea pig, so to speak, you know, before you turn it out there, you know, and, and, the, and the wisdom in that is if you're willing to do this yourself, then when people are going through it, and there's and they're being challenged or they're you know they're they're having some difficulties you know what they are you know you, you can feel what they're going through and your ability to help them is that it's just that much better and i love that you said that because um i did not study um anything you know undergrad i had psychology degree but after um a manic episode nine years ago i've gone on my healing journey and i've learned so much and i'm able to help others just from what i've learned through healing um, and I always wonder how therapists actually help others um, I, if they don't understand it, um, kind of. So is there like a mismatch there? or are Yeah, you... there is. Yeah. And, and I can pick out uh, a therapist who has gone through some things, uh, ha whose uh, uh, skills of empathy and sympathy and be able to connect. I can pick that out right away. Um, what happens is a lot of people, I, I always call them the textbook counselors, you know, and the textbook coaches, and they, they, they do some things and then they say, okay, I got this. Let me go help the next person. But you don't got this, uh, you know, life's dynamic. It's fluid. It keeps on changing and we have to keep on going with it. So, you know, what we think we learned years ago, uh, you know, it doesn't always apply anymore. Plus, particularly young people today, they think completely different than we do, you know, the, the different processing, it's a different world. So we really have to constantly be keeping up and, and never think of yourself as someone who has it all together. Yeah, I love that. Um, and let's talk about that. Children think differently. Can you expand upon that, please? 
Well, you look at, you know, I, I was a child, you know, we really grew up in the 60s. And, uh, you know, there was a whole different way to do things. You know, we didn't lock doors. You went outside and played. Um, everything went slow. If something happened at school, it stayed there. You came home and did whatever you did. The next day, it was probably gone. This is a fast, aggressive world that, that these kids are growing up in. Parents do not understand it. We didn't grow up in it. Uh, it's only now this generation, p people that have uh, kids that are, you know, young kids that have come up in the computer age and things going fast. So, you know, uh, the ability to understand how fast these kids are processing, uh, the morality is different. The the consciousness is the whole the whole thing is completely different. So we, we really have to, you know, I listen to the kids when I when I'm talking to them. I I don't try to move them to my way of thinking. I try to understand theirs. And once I do that, they're more willing to let me in to begin with. And then I'm going to pick up on more on some more things. And, you know, so the, so you, you never think that you have, the, even though 43 years, people say, gee, you have all the answers. And I said, no, I just have all the questions. <laughs> That's oh, all. I love that. And working on the answers. Exactly. So, so let, well, let's hear the pros and cons about the, uh, the children's brains these days. And also, like, what age child are we talking about? Is there like the five-year-old versus the 25-year-old? Are those different? Yeah, it, it, they are different. You're talking about a generation of difference, uh, you know, and um, someone who is 25 years old uh, really was born around the time computers were really established themselves in the home. Someone who is five years old now, this is everyone's doing it. You know, so it, it now has become a, become a cultural norm before it was a transitional thing. We were moving out of, you know, gee, we came home, we uh, watched television. Maybe we had a cell phone, uh, but, you know, not, it wasn't on the Internet. You know, everything is different for all these kids and, and parents, you know, they're, they're coming on to this for the first time. They have no, When parents bring their kids in, I don't care what age it is, they say these kids have problems. And I look at it and I say, no, you all do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not the, yes the kids have things to deal with but if you're here and you don't know what to do with it it's a family thing right i love that yeah hopefully the parents are open to hearing that and help and yeah. being part of the uh realizing they might be the part of the problem or helping to be part of the solution well they're stuck in it with everyone you know and it just it's just about learning how to open everyone up and and, and you know and let them trust each other let, let them feel safe and and, and just talk Right. Well, it's interesting because I'm 57, but I definitely um probably, you know, act younger and have a little uh, ADD, ADHD from childhood drama. So I can, I think, I feel like I can relate a lot to the younger generation. Um, And it's interesting because, you know, I see people I work with, whether we call it multitasking or ADD, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing. So you're getting more things done, but I don't know how much they're in the present moment, right? If your brain's going so fast. Well, that's the problem. Um, they're going, they are going so fast. It's hard. They'll be in the moment, but it's hard for them to stay there because it's just so many things coming into their world. Um, you know, and, and the other part is, you know, we had, um, call it an identity, a, a role that we knew we were going to play. We knew you, you, you evolve into this. They don't. They really, you know, they're trying on all different kinds of labels and personalities and all different kinds of things. And they have a million choices and we didn't. Uh, and, you know, they may have more options, but their ability to make choices, to gather information and then make choices about their options. That's where they're having problems. Interesting. Interesting. So what advice would you give to somebody um, watching or listening, a parent that has a child? Um, in the, this young generation? A couple of things. The first thing is you got to slow things down if you can. And that's hard because parents, you know, they plug right into the uh, accelerated pace. And when I say to them, let, you know, a, a, a little bit of time to talk to your kids. Oh my God, where am I going to find the time? They say, on the other hand, uh, they're, they're spending an hour on social media at night, you know, and they know everything going on uh, with, with all their friends and everything else, you know, you just got to rearrange it. I always tell them, start from scratch. Uh, just throw the stuff and get your social media out of the picture. Slow down. If you can have dinners together, that'd be great. Uh, but give yourself some time to talk with your kids, with your family, your spouse. No one's doing it anymore. 
if if yeah. we're not doing it, well, how, how are we going to get the information about each other? So I love that. And what's interesting, um, so I grew up in a generation, my parents didn't talk. I didn't learn how to talk. So if I didn't learn how to talk, how am I going to really learn to communicate? Not just how was your day fine and a story, right? But just for really. So have you seen that? Like a lot of parents um, have a handicap because they haven't learned it from their parents. You know, that's the thing we always said, and it's true. It's definitely true. Now, yeah, it's not the exception. Now, that is pretty much the norm. Um, you know, parents mm. don't know what their kids are doing. Yeah. Um, and they it's, and they accept that as a way of living that goes fast. The parents are plugging into what they have to do. Um, typically, both people are working. Uh, they're going fast. They're, everything costs a lot of money, so they're trying to make a lot of money. Uh, they have the kids in a number of sports things or after school things or whatever it may be. So it's get home, grab something real quick, go to whatever they're doing, stop maybe on the uh, way home and grab some fast food, get home. It's eight o'clock. Kids do a couple things and everybody goes to bed. And then the simple question of, did you do your homework? No one even knows. Then they get, of course, they get the the notices from school that somebody's not doing things. Yeah. And that's, that's standard. Uh, this is what I see most of the time with with kids and parents. Um, parents are trying to catch up. Parents should never be in a position to have to catch up. We are supposed to lead, mm. not follow. What? The revolt, yeah, that's some- reversed. And that's hard because societal pressures. Listen, I, my kids are now 22 to 28, but I was definitely in that um rat race and we my husband and I had a therapist that helped us with parenting because our middle one with his gifts and challenges Asperger's ADHD and the therapist said to us do you guys feel like you're in a treadmill going nowhere you know and it's like and it's just so gosh it's so hard to really like you know if you work less and you have a smaller house or you live in an apartment and spend more time with your kids it's great for the kids but you know, to have the parents be okay with that. I mean, right there, the therapy is more for the parents than the children. Mm-hmm. And and that's the issue, you know, Th- they're trying too hard to do too many things. Multitasking uh, for people who don't multitask well, that's been, again, the order of the day. And, mm. it, you know, it, you, there's a point where you have to look at it and say, I, I got to catch my breath. I have to get off the treadmill. They're trying to uh, do everything we tell them to do uh, just by maybe slowing the treadmill down a few notches. And I said, well, you're still on it. You know, if you're still on it, you are still running. You are still going nowhere. You are still going to get tired and angry and frustrated. You need to step off. And it's not going to hurt your kids. Believe me, pulling them off their social media is not going to hurt them. They think it's the end of the world, but right, it's not. Um, yeah, that's such a big ask. What about instead of a hundred percent, what about like limiting it versus getting off? Well, well, that's what you do. You take care like anything else, business before pleasure. You say, okay, fine. Uh, you know, you, we have this after school, you take care of that. You come home, you get your homework done. When you have your homework done, this is your bedtime in there. I don't care if you want to go on and do what you want to do at that point, but I want to make sure that, you know, You've taken care of business. We've talked. I understand where you are. You're, you're you're taking care of your own business, homework and whatever it may be. And then what kids will say is, that leaves me no time. To, it might be a half hour or 40 minutes, and that's not enough. And I understand it goes fast, but, you know. Right. So there's a saying I heard that le- learning to talk so your kids will listen and learning to listen so your kids will talk. Can you speak to that? Well, that's a communication thing. You and I are having a conversation right now. You're speaking, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm reacting to it. You hear what I say and you react and it goes back and forth. Uh, That's all that is. We listen to each other and we respond to what the other person is saying. What I find people doing is one is talking and the other is not listening, they're reloading. They're ready to say their next thing and everyone is just talking and no one's listening, no communication. Wow, and also what about the fact like, um? You know, sometimes that parent-child dynamic is really challenging. Um, the parents, you know, want one thing for the child, the child wants something else. And, you know, they're not able to listen because they're coming, like, I don't know if it's their ego or their, like, their expectations are getting in the way to have that open, flowing communication. You know, parents, for, again, they forget the role they're in. 
we already we're we're the adults we run the show it's our show <laughs> we're casting i always tell my kids say i didn't ask to be born i said good you are born i cast you in this role now do what i say i'm the director you know <laughs> we, we we try to make a joke of it but this is the way you know i i ran things and people would come in the office and we and i we had four kids you know and we were able to do that and Kids come in the office, uh, parents come in the office now, and they have one or two, and they say, my God, how, it, and they do this, and I say, seriously, that was a vacation for me, you know, <laughs> if you had one or two kids at home. They don't, if you're going to be a parent, you have to be one that wants to parent. Mm. It's as simple mm. as that. You have yeah. to want to parent. Yeah, it's definitely challenging, and there's that fine line between mm -hmm enabling versus empowering absolutely right? and parenting from fear versus faith love and trust and it's trust me i've gone through it and i'm glad i'm past it but it's really there's a really hard balance you know and you ask you know you get all a pediatrician or a therapist you get all these different answers what's right about you know even it starts when the kids are young and sleeping in the parents bed or not and all these things it's so hard to navigate that and that's what they do parents are parenting for convenience they don't want to be challenged. They don't want to put a ton of time into this. This is, I, I'm not sure why they had children when they were thinking, well, what did I, what, why am I, I, I always tell the, the young couples that come in, you want to have kids. I, I say, why? And they look at me like I have two heads. And I say, what exactly do you want to do? Because you are going to give up your life. You're not going to maintain who you are. You know, the parent that once says, well, no, I get so much time a day myself. I have to have that to take care of myself and clear my head. And I said, then you shouldn't have kids. <laughs> it's pretty much cut and dry. That's who, the, who you are as a parent. If you think you have to program so much time into the day for yourself, that's not what this is all about. Because that time you're doing, you're taking for yourself. You have just stolen from your kids. And we have this normalization of self-care and we have exaggerated it. You know, you mm -hmm. can take care of yourself without compromising your children. So interesting. So what do people, what do the couples usually say why they want to have children? Oh, I think it, you know, I, I get all this. I think it would be nice. Oh, I can't. Nice. I want to have a little girl. I, want, I said, stop. What do you want? Yeah. That it's not what they've thought about, you know. Yeah, you... I'm thinking about to me and what you know, and and so many of my husbands know BGY, and I speak to all his patients, and it's just amazing. Like, there was a um, you know, there was a patient, she's anorexic. As soon as she delivered her baby, she was so sad because that baby wasn't in there anymore. And a lot of women, probably including myself, like we have children for our security and for like our reasons, which is oh my god, one of the worst reasons to have a child, right? Uh, exactly. You, you know, the answer should be, I, I, I'm i going to love these people. I want to teach them. I want to spend as much time with them. I want us to be a, a good family unit uh, and, and, and you know, uh, have them ask me questions. These are developing lives. I want to be part of that. I want to teach them how to live and be happy. And I, and I really want to love doing that. Yeah. You know? And that's the key. You know, I, I, I parent, I'll, I'll see even friends, I'll see them. I would see them and say, where are you going? You know, where are you going? I'm going home. Oh, the kids, I got to do this. And I got, and I said, geez, if you really believe that, you know, it should be, I can't wait till I get home to be with my kids. Yeah. I think, you know, why did you have them? Uh, you know, I, I mean, we went yeah. out, you know, I had a few friends every now and then something, you know, it would, but for the most part, I probably spent 95% of my time with my kids. You know, I live, a uh, couple hours from Philly and, you know, we, I would take kids to a ball game. I would take them individually every year. I would take them as, as a group. Mm -hmm. When we come home, we're doing things and we're hiking and we're, we're, we're out in the pool or we're playing basketball, whatever, whatever it may be. And then it was at night when I got home from the office, the first, the first thing I did was hit one room at a time and say, Hey, what's up and spend 15 minutes. So, you know, uh, you know, you get home and, and, you know, I've been talking to people all day and then the next hour is to see where they are and connect. So I know what's going on and they can say, I got him. You know, if I, if, you know, he, he likes to be with me. I, you know, that's the other thing. Your kids should be able to say my mother and or father really likes to be with me. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, there's a family I know that I think they had like third or fourth child was in high school and they're like, I'm done. Like, I'm going to yeah. go out now. And in high school, the child needed them the most. And when the parents would go out, the child would party and all this stuff. And it was, um, it's definitely an eight, Teen year commitment per child plus and then mm-hmm. the other thing is some you know like especially for moms like when we that need for the child which isn't healthy and then when we're ready to send them off to college we're supposed to be sending them, them off with their angel wings as opposed to like speaking to them every day and needing too much like you know that that unhealthy connection and, and the bottom line is if we are not available they're going they are going to find replacements mm. And yeah. we're asking people who are unskilled in finding quality replacements at this level to replace us. They're going to find someone who says, I like spending time with you. And wow. that's not always, you know, the, yeah. they don't always make the best choice. Sometimes it's it's typically what feels good. Wow. Interesting. Well, I love everything you're sharing with us. I definitely want to talk. I see a lot more children these days have anxiety. And I know that you have a a published book that you're going to share with us. Um, It's called Fix Your Anxiety Handbook. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So we're going to take a brief break and we'll be right back. And we can't wait to hear about the handbook. So stay tuned. In these shifting and changing times, more and more lives are being impacted by mental health. The Extraordinary Lives Foundation, also known as ELF, is transforming the way people view and navigate mental health challenges. Their mission is to improve children's mental health and wellness and support families by providing educational tools, resources, and awareness events. ELF encourages families to recognize symptoms, overcome the stigma, and reach out for help. Through prevention, early intervention, and holistic treatment, we believe many of the big problems facing today's youth can be transformed within a generation. Extraordinary Lives Foundation is excited to offer the Hugs for Life Healing Center, growing a worldwide network of approved holistic healers and bridging the gap between traditional and complementary healing options. Visit the Extraordinary Lives Foundation website at www.elfempowers.org to find out more about their resources and events. Together, we can change the conversation around mental health. We hope that you're enjoying today's Let's Talk Wellness podcast. And if you have a topic that you would like us to explore, we would love to hear from you. Simply email us at info at elfempowers.org. That's info at elfempowers.org. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mary James, and today we're speaking with psychologist and author, Faust Ruggiero. Welcome back, Faust. Thanks, Mara. I think we're having a great conversation before. I'm interested to see where we're going to go with it. Absolutely. It's great. We discussed what we were going last week. We spoke about where we thought we were going to go. And now we're just going with the flow. And it's um, it's been really insightful to me. So I'm sure this is really going to help others. So let's hear about your published book, Fix Your Anxiety Handbook. Who is it geared toward? It's geared toward everyone. You know, when I write, I try to, unless I specify it, I try to keep it uh, something that's general enough uh, so that it can reach the various uh, demographics, but also that it can be specific enough so people can say, yeah, that's me. Um, we, we did a, I did a, a first book, which was the Fix Yourself Handbook, which is very general. It has a, a 36 different problems in there and then uh, what to do with them. We went into anxiety now and now we're going, going to publish depression by the end of the year uh, all in in the fix yourself series um the anxiety i think just needed to come next we thought about a number of different things but when we looked out to see what was happening uh, in the nation and in the world um the anxiety just got to be so big particularly after the pandemic so we really felt that that needed to be the next move absolutely and you say we who's the we Uh, a little team i have you know my publisher and uh um, uh, my my publicist and uh, you know agents uh, you know copywriter all all those people we get together and we'll just say what do you think is next and everybody had an idea and the more we talked about it it came down to you know the conversation 
we didn't say anxiety, but the conversation with what the way people were treating each other and what we were feeling, obviously, po uh, you know, moved in that direction. So that's what I did. I love that. And there's just the, the universe is trying to throw us into so much fear and anxiety these days that it's um, it's a perfect next title. So after the depression, what do you think about doing one for parents? Parents handbook. That is going to come up down the road. We have a couple ideas in the way we want to do something for discrimination. We want to do something for faith. Um, parenting is one. Um, relationships is going to be something. So, you know, as the series develops, although that is one of the topics so for parents. Beautiful. And also the uh, pre-parent one will be really good, as we were discussing before. <laughs> Definitely more challenging, you know, to, for people to like get out. You know, when you get engaged, you're married and have children, you're on this like bubble of fantasy land. You know, um, my, some things might kind of burst the bubble, bring you down to when you really analyze why someone wants to have children. So can you share with us um, some of your tricks and tools in your fixing your anxiety handbook? You know, sure. Um, when I write the books, I should say, I keep my chapters uh, very small, very short, uh, six, seven, eight pages tops. And then I tell people exactly at the end of the chapter, these are the steps you need to take to fix this particular thing or to address that particular issue. So the thing I, I, I like to focus on with anxiety is to help people understand it is primarily a physical condition. You know, we get anxious and we start you know, the body tightens and our mind goes all over the place. And the first thing we do is try to figure out where it came from. It must have been that thing and that person and what happened. That's not going to even if you even if you find it, even if you said, OK, it's the boss at work or or my my relationship uh, person or whatever it may be. Even if you even if you identify it, you're going to see that it doesn't change. You have anxiety because physically your body moves into anxiety. It could be a chemical imbalance. It could be um, uh, a thyroid. It could be anything, but it's physical and we need to attack it physical, uh, physically first. That's the first thing I tell people. Learn how to calm your body down. You know, get away from accelerants. We'll do what we were talking to just before the break and slow your life down a little bit. You know, we're going at an accelerated pace. We're eating horrible foods. Mm. We are putting accelerants in our body to keep up with the pace. We're not sleeping well because of all of this. Then we're getting angry. We're having uh, arguments and, and, and in our lives and, and our lives are not working the way they should. All of these things keep on, you know, just like fuel for the fire. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, always, I always call it food for the demon. If you want to keep doing that, then your life doesn't change. So that's the first order of business. Get your body down, learn how to breathe a little bit slower, get the things out of there that, you know, out of your life that don't work. Let me ask you a question. So like sugar and caffeine, mm. are those part of the enemy? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Because you know, it makes sugar. sense. Like when, you know, I cut down my caffeine one cup a day and now I'm working on zero cups. But it's interesting. I'm like if my body needs energy, then sleep more as opposed to doing that. You um, do more things. You eat properly. You exercise. You put all those things. Again, we're back to that quick fix thing. I don't do what I should. I'll get up in the morning. I'll put the pot of coffee on uh, during the day. Maybe I'll have an energy drink or I'll have do something, loads of sugar and, and carbs all day long. And then you at the, end, at the night, at night, I just kind of crash. And then I just I'm, I may or may not sleep well. You know, well, you know what I'll do? I'll take this supplement and that thing to get to bed. Well, we'll do that. Now I get up in the morning. I'm a little groggy because that's what that stuff does. And then I, you know what I'm going to do? The coffee's ready to go. And then I start the whole thing all over again. And, you know, noon comes along or one o'clock and I get an energy drink or I get a soda that's got, you know, 36 or 40 grams of sugar in it. And then you, and I say to them, do you understand where that part of it's coming from. We got to purge the garbage before we get into the good stuff. Wow. Yeah. It's like that, that you know, vicious cycle, kind of like that treadmill I was talking about, but wow. Okay. But so after, yeah. I, a person said to me, it must, you know, why are we getting so much more anxiety today? I said, well, go back 25 years ago. It was a slower pace. We weren't running all over the place. We weren't putting all this garbage into our bodies. We talked about three good meals and uh, a few, uh, you know, um, snacks or whatever. We, we did all we did basically the right things. So we didn't have a ton of anxiety. The pace was slower. So what's changed in, in 
in a generation that got us to this point, we're going very fast and we're doing things to our body, our bodies that do not work. Put those two things together and you have the, per the, the perfect storm, the perfect formula for anxiety. Wow. And also what with 9-11 and, you know, this everything that's just happening in COVID, like it's throwing, a, you know, icing on the cake, I guess. Or, well, you, you know, know, for the you know when you talk about COVID, those types of things, some people reacted and got so much anxiety and some people did not. Yeah. And I say to the people who got it, why do you think the other people didn't get it? Well, because the rest of their life was in order. So they were strong enough so that when the pandemic hit, they took a step back. That's what I did. I took a step back and I said, oh, okay, what do I have to do here? Versus, yeah. oh my God, my life's going to change. What am I going to do? It's a whole different way of, of, uh, of talking to yourself. Yeah. So if, if you keep yourself strong and your body doing what it's supposed to do and your emotions where they're supposed to be, when things happen, they don't affect you in quite the same way. And you'll see that we something happens, we react now. We don't think and say, what do I want to do? We jump right in and we're going to kill the world here. <laughs> Definitely more reactive than, yeah. I don't know if it's proactive or just, yeah, just letting it come. Um, so what other tools do you have in your book? So after we're eating better, getting a good night's sleep, um, doing our breathing, what comes next? Well, what, what you're, remember, you're slowing your world down. So I talk about things like uh, getting your breathing down. Let's learn to do that. Um Put some things in your life um, that don't take a lot of time, 20 minutes, a half hour, uh, but that calm your body down. It could be meditation. It could be yoga, those types of things. Definitely learn how to breathe differently. Um, we are going to rearrange a schedule. That's such a huge thing. You know, these people are going all day long, getting five hours of sleep. Uh, you know, REM sleep is way down. So you should be getting up you can the same time every day you should be get your uh, uh, body on a daily schedule these things basically occur for the most part uh, on schedule go to bed the same time put that in your life we're all over the place mm. you know uh, our nutrition is terrible you know i mean a typical household and I, example i had a person come in um Last week and said, um, new person, I said, well, tell me the schedule. Well, I have, you know, two kids and we get up in the morning and, you know, I, I have to go to work. My husband goes to work, she says, and when we come home, it's five o'clock. And then we start with, um, I said, do you have dinner at home? Oh, no, because we have to get the kids to this and the kids to that. I said, well, when do you eat? Well, we grab something on the way home. That's usually one of the fast food places. Or she says, well, sometime we do a little better. We'll go to like Subway. I said, Subway, Th that's a good meal. She says, well, absolutely. I mean, I said, it's, I said, 60% of it's bread. Okay. And then you put some meats on it, uh, which are cold cut kinds of things. Uh, you might get some chicken. And all. Okay. Maybe it did okay there. Were there vegetables or fruits? Did you, what, what did, they, what did you get them to drink with that? I mean, do, do, do they have good drinks there? Soda? Right. So the point is the definition of good nutrition has been redefined to uh, to accommodate a fast food style of life. You know, food is what goes in your body. It tells your body, it gives your body the fuel to do what it's supposed to do. If you're missing some things or you have too many things that aren't so good that are in there, welcome to the anxiety, welcome to the depression, whatever it may be. You're not giving your body the fuel it needs. Wow. And you talked about breathing differently. Can you expand upon that, please? Well, when we go fast, when our body's accelerated, uh, our respiration, our breathing is, is faster and it's more shallow. Mm. And as it, it, and, and if it, when we go fast, we take in less oxygen than we should and we take in more carbon dioxide. The mm. exchange is not the way it's supposed to be. Slower breaths, fill your lungs, empty your lungs it should be on account of about eight seconds for breath you know i try to give people a basic rule into your in those out through your mouth but you know that that as you get more into it but at least get to the point where you consciously slow your breath your breathing down when you slow your breathing down two things happen one is you stay in the moment because you have to focus on it and two if you're going slower with your breathing your body 
decelerates just a little bit, mm. less anxiety. Love it. Wow. Wow. Um, what, so parents, if their children or themselves are experiencing anxiety, what other tools, I mean, is there a point where there's just something where the child might need medication or therapy to help them because their anxiety is just off the charts and they've tried everything? Yeah. I, you know, medication can work uh, if you want to go that route. Some people it has to, well, when you get to the point that uh, it's out of control, their panic attacks, things like that you're probably going to do some things that uh, that are going to you know quickly calm your body down. Otherwise, it's going to accelerate to the point that you might say, get me to the hospital. Uh, so, you know, uh, medication for some people. For most people, it's just really changing the way they live their life. And when I get them into counseling and I, and I say these things and they say, it can't be just that. I said, well, work with me. Let's do a test. For a week, all I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this for what for seven days, and we plan their basic diet out. I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, but let's get basic on on your diet. Let's get up at this time. Let's go to bed at this time. L let's do something real big. Let's take you off social media for one week, because you have no idea how much social media correlates with anxiety. Really? Why is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Because it has the brain going very fast. You are completely engaged. Plus, most people on social media, to some extent, are seeing things that are designed to provoke anxiety. Most of what the, the press doesn't put wonderful things on, on social media. Think about it. When, when, when do your major news outlets put something that's wonderful on? No, they don't. Okay. And, and election years come and we, and we get crazy oh. and we, and we take a tragedy and we keep on going over and over and over because it sells, uh, you know, and then it's the arguing back and forth on social media, you know, and, and what, the, and, and this person just posted this horrible thing and you say, well, I didn't react to it. No, but your mind got it. Mm. And I said, and they're all, none of them are going to believe me when I say that none of them are going to believe me and they'll, and they'll defend and minimize and tell me it's not true. I said, well, good. Let's see how anxious you are one week from today with no social media. Let's just do the test. Don't believe me. I'm very, I'm happy with that. Don't believe me. Let's just do it. So they make these changes. They come back and I say, how was your week? And they say, it was actually better. And I say, gee, uh, what did you do something different? <laughs> and then we go over the changes. And, they, and I say, I understand, life goes fast. You might have to plug in, but you do not have to, you know, put yourself into it purposefully all the time. Mm. Slow it down. I love get that. Your body, get your body healthy, puts exercise into your plan. But I, I always call it the E word because when I say exercise, they, they say, ooh, yeah. Well, I said, <laughs> I'm sure because just about everyone has exercise equipment in their house that they use for something to put oh, their clothes on. on or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, I said, use it 20 minutes. That's all. Go use it for 20 minutes. See the difference. Your body's going to get stronger. The stronger mm -hmm. your body is, the less anxiety, anxiety you typically have. Mm, interesting. And for parents to do it, put their oxygen mask on first. because. <laughs> you know, and, and also, and then hopefully teach their children the same. Yeah. Again, they learn from us. And, and that's the other thing about, that's a good point you just made. <clears throat> the parents are, are experiencing anxiety. The children live in the house with them. So now the whole house has been accelerated. Now it's everyone feeding off everyone else and the vibe uh, you know, on a scale of one to 10 is a nine. <laughs> I mean, maybe 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, we're, if you're from New York like me. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. you know, that's the other problem. So if you can get everyone in the house to do it, now you're feeding off some different things here. You mm. slow down just a little bit. That doesn't mean the anxiety will be gone. But gee, if it goes from a nine to a five, you did okay. Absolutely. And also these children, I feel like are being born and more empathic. They literally feel energy around them. So when they're feeling their parents' energy, they don't even have to be next to them. And um, that's why it's so important. I always tell my clients, put our oxygen mask on first before we can even help our children. You know, it's interesting. A woman comes in and says her, uh, they, um, they're they doing a trial separation and they have two dogs. <clears throat> and when the, 
that were together and fighting and the anxiety was way up. The dogs were misbehaving, uh, soiling in the house, chewing furniture. When they separated, mm -hmm. the dogs about after about a week began to calm down and these behaviors weren't so pronounced. And I said, that's the dog's version of anxiety. The dog fed off yours, just like your kids will, and you'll feed off other people's. And you, so you try to slow the house down, get everybody together. This is how we're going to do things. And they will count on this. They will rebel in the beginning because they're going so fast. They can't even fathom the idea yeah. of slowing down. Well, that change, that see where the change is really yeah. hard for everybody, right? For everyone. Well, you know, there's a part of our brain that likes to go on autopilot and just go and not have to think and just make things happen. And now we say, oh, no, no, we're going to slow that down. That piece we're not going to do that one. We're going to slow way down and we're going to put these new pieces in. They say, oh, no, I'm not. No. Well, also getting rid of that monkey talk, right? A lot of people have like the negative self talk, so they're running go, so they don't have to listen to it. Yeah, and that you know that that internal language is huge. When I I, I tell the person, uh, when people come in my office, I'll say, if I say something to you, do me a favor, don't say, oh my god, I can't do that, because you already told yourself what you don't want to hear. Say, whether you're talking to me or your your spouse, let me think about that. Let's yeah. see if we can do it. If my wife brings something up and I look at it and I say, in my mind, I don't think I want to do that. But I'll real, what, what I'll say is, okay, let's look at it. Because what I did is I just took my resistance out of the picture. Wow. What if she has a great idea? And she typically does. Uh, then I just said, oh, you know, and now we're not feeling good about each other. And now it's my resistance that's not making it work. So uh, it's that internal language, you know, give it a try. And, and with uh, people, when you come to counseling, what are you doing? You're having someone, you're going to pour your soul out. You're going to give them all the information. That person is going to say, let's try these things. And then, you know what most people do? Oh, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, and then I'll say, hey, you came to see me. Why? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. You know. So then I said, try this. Let's not make the change. Let's only try it. Yeah. And all I want you to do is is put yourself into it as, as as much as you can, and let's talk about it next week. Then they come back and say that wasn't so bad. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. Don't change. Just try it for a week. I love that. Try it on. Try it on. Exactly. That's beautiful. Um, and do you do virtual therapy sessions? I do. I, I, I my preference is is in the office. I mean, but you know what's happened now as we as the books have been out there, and I've been doing all these interviews, and I, I just did one on. I'm sure you're coast to coast radio. You've seen so you know a couple million people, and so now people will say, "Well, can you counsel me?" So we're seeing more of that um, online stuff. Uh, but my preference is always to sit down with a person who I can see where I can see their body language and I can, uh, you know, we're right in that same safe place. Yeah. When you counsel from your home, you are typically counseling from the very environment where all the stuff in your life is happening. You don't even step out of that. So, you know, that's, that puts you at a deficit to begin with. Um, you know, wow. normally we yeah. want to change that environment, but we want to get you out so you can, you know, be away from it, catch your breath and and then go back in and start making some changes. So you're really when we come in uh, into a person's home, we're really already already downstream, so to speak, you know. Interesting. Interesting. So we'll share the link to your book um, in the show information. And mm -hmm. what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Best way is just to go to my website. It is my name, FosterRuggero.com. Uh, when you get there, you'll find everything about me, the books, everything is there. Um, you can contact me there. I'm pretty good about getting back to people too. Beautiful. And we'll put that in the, uh, we won't spell it out now. We'll just put that in the show um, mm -hmm. information. Yeah. And um, is there any last thing you'd like to share with our friends watching and listening? Yeah. You know what? It's all about making the right choices. If you, if you are okay with being anxious and running around and embracing this style, then you'll have your anxiety. It'll be part of your life. And, you know, you'll, you'll go into your drop, as we always say. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're willing to make some choices, uh, then life is going to change. If you don't think you know how, then get help. There's nothing wrong with that. Go talk to someone who can, you know, help you uh, 
to take the information apart and, and, and maybe give you some new ways to do things. It works. You know, it's, it's your life. You have to consider yourself worthy of a person, you know, who is, can be happy. And if you're willing to do the work, it happens. Yeah. And when you say the word change, I think that frightens people, but, uh, but it's changed for the better. Like well, people don't, you know, they don't know what they don't know. I, you know, I've been working with like a 60 something year old who kept, with her anxiety and chases her tail in circles and she doesn't know who she'd be without it. So that's it. She's committed to not changing. But you know, for those, Mara, there's a reason why people fear change is because they they're here and they look at what the end result is going to be. And that's a huge jump. Mm-hmm. No one changes that fast. Yeah. It's a step by step process. I've just, in fact, I was just writing about this in the new book. You go to your counselor, you talk, give them the information, that person, the information, they tell you what, what, what kind of things we can do. And they say, okay, here's our goal, but let's do this step, then this step, then this step. And you come back every week and talk about the steps you're, you're taking and refine it and move some things around. And eventually you get to the change. All you're doing is a little bitty step at a time. You can definitely do that. I love it. So how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. Foss, it's been such a pleasure um, speaking with you. And for you and all of our friends out there, you are amazing. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk Wellness. This podcast has been brought to you by the Hugs for Life Healing Center, a division of the Extraordinary Lives Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you would like to listen to more conversations like this, we invite you to subscribe to our mailing list at www.elfempowers.org to be notified when our weekly episodes are published. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to bringing you our next conversation on Let's Talk Wellness.